below Peter Blackwood icon diary. Each year, Philip Davidov and very often his wife Olga Shalomova visit Melbourne to conduct icon workshops. And if I can, I attend at least uh, one or two of these workshops. And this year, I attended a two week workshop with Philip, and at the end, we painted an icon of Christ on the cross, a crucifix. Philip and Olga are renowned iconographers and teachers of iconography from St. Petersburg. Philip teaches not only in Russia, but in America and Italy, Australia, New Zealand, Canada. And there were 10 of us in this workshop over two weeks. The first week was dedicated to examining the parts of the body, drawing them a little bit of painting, but mainly drawing, uh, looking at uh, photos of skeletons and hands and feet and torsos and heads and things like that. And so we were drawing uh, hands, uh, examining how the bone structure worked. We uh, looked at hands from the, the back uh, and from the front uh, and also, although not in a crucifix, we uh, looked at, at hands that commonly appear in uh, other icons that are holding things like a cross. Very often uh, hands held in blessing and uh, uh, different uh, ways in which those uh, hands uh, are held in blessing. Uh, you'd have to be quite disjointed to... Uh, have uh, hands held in some of these postures, uh, but also uh, because a crucifix does feature feet, uh, we looked at the, the structure of feet and uh, how best to, to draw them and paint them. So we were drawing from nine until five with a good hour's break. We were looking at muscle structures in arms. We looked at muscle structures in legs. We looked at the proportions of uh, a torso. We looked at how the torso uh, is built up with its muscles. We looked at how to draw a face three quarters on and tilted. And then we did some painting. We uh, rehearsed painting the uh, head of, uh, the, the, of Christ on the cross and uh, by this time we had chosen uh, colours and were uh, doing quite detailed uh, analysis of how this uh, face and hair and beard would look and we rehearsed uh, painting the uh, loincloth, getting the uh, highlights worked out. Then we were looking at how our figure would appear on uh, our, the cross that, that uh, we would be painting on, the, the panel, uh, a little bit more detailed. Uh, then with yellow ochre, we were starting to rehearse how that figure would look. And uh, it wasn't until right at the end of the first week that we received our uh, cruciform uh, panel and started to uh, paint uh, our figure onto that cross, but only with uh, yellow ochre and water. Then we had three days off and we came back to paint in earnest. Philip teaches by demonstration and then you go back and uh, work and he comes around and critiques. And uh, so at the beginning of the second week the panel was ready for work. 
first thing to do, uh, sand off some of what you've already done and redo. Get those lines right. Painting with a large hog hair brush. Just uh, yellow ochre and water. But then early on we need to choose our colours, the flesh tones, which I'd thought would be you know, in a Vedaccio red uh, with a background of uh, lemon ochre and yellow uh, de terra vert, the cross in a, uh, a red brown, and the, uh, the ground underneath uh, an orange, orange brown. So they were colours chosen early on, but they tended to change as life went along. And using what had been learnt in the first week about uh, constructing a head that's three quarters on and tilted, uh, making quite meticulous measurements to get the roundness of the skull and then the jaw dropping in the right direction and choosing where the bridge of the nose will go on a three-quarter figure. Philip demonstrating his uh, uh, lines, his shading on the head of uh, his very large demonstration icon, which was just cardboard, but it behaves much the same way as the, uh, the gessoed panels. And here he's added uh, black to his yellow. It's, uh, and so we followed suit. The light sometimes uh, from the roof of this wonderful uh, art space at the Australian Catholic University was a bit bright. So I was glad to have my Detroit Tigers cap to uh, keep the light out of my eyes. But adding the uh, black to the yellow, and by this time using um, the egg tempera uh, with the pigment, but still using uh, this time a smaller um, uh, hog hair brush and more sandpapering. The models that are sitting uh, pinned to the side of the easel, it's the basic uh, model, the coloured one, uh, is the shape that I'm working to, but the one on the other side, the black and white image peeking underneath where I've got my colour codes uh, lined up, uh, the uh, loincloth uh, was a preferable design, so that's why that's there. Uh, sort of flicking back and forward between two models. These hands needed uh, to be reworked, so rather than lose it, the, the sandpaper moves, uh, knocks it back uh, so that it can be, be painted over. It is uh, 100 gauge sandpaper. Now with a very uh, fine brush, getting those details lined up in the face, needing to be dark enough so that uh, they can still be seen when the flesh tones are put over the top, uh, but they'll uh, be there waiting. Uh, I'm now getting these folds in the loincloth. As 
I keep checking on the model over to my right rather than the model, the coloured model on the left because the loincloth on the right was much more interesting. Folds are such fun. Then we worked on the face and had mixed the flesh tones and applied them so you can still see the uh, shading for the face that had been put in underneath and then adding a little titanium white, very little, just beginning to do the uh, initial highlighting on the nose, on the brow bone. And another lighter shade, the next highlight. Always start on the nose because that always has more highlight than anything else. That's a safe spot to start. I'm keeping this video at normal speed. I usually speed up the, <laughs> the boring bits, but on this occasion I've wanted to give a more accurate impression of the painstaking uh, steps that are taken. It is a very slow process. In sped up versions of painting, it makes it look so easy, but it's not. Philip kept reminding us, this is not easy. <laughs> He's right. While I haven't sped this up, I have turned the sound off. We did work in, in silence, but in the soundtrack you can sort of hear the, a lot of the hum of the air conditioner and things like that. And also uh, a lot of the background noises of Philip giving instruction to uh, other fellow artists, iconographers. So he's moving around between the ten of us all the time, giving advice, <laughs> correcting uh, our biggest bloopers. Now the hair with the very dark pigment putting in the the major hairlines.
ですよ。Uh, putting in the curl the hair strands that stray onto the shoulder. This was all very well, but uh, <laughs> sometime later they disappeared underneath the uh, skin tones and highlights and had to be put back again much later on. Uh, but here is a, 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 a red brown glaze going on to the hair. Use titanium white between the strands to uh, make the distinction between the dark lines more obvious. Uh, this required quite a number of coats of the glaze. It's the same colour used for the cross, but it went on on the cross much uh, with much more pigment, less egg, didn't need so many coats. There was enough light with the white coming through from behind this, these glazes not to require any highlights in the hair. And the same uh, colour that was the base colour for the face was mixed for going on to the torso, arms, hands and legs. I have waxed lyrical in the past on the virtues of the Kalinsky brushes. But for the most part in this workshop, while we were using a few Kalinsky brushes, we were mainly using squirrel brushes. And squirrel is much softer and it doesn't have the kind of uh, precision that a Kalinsky brush has, which is, which is a, a firmer brush. But for skin tones and for blending, it's pretty neat. So I'm a new fan of squirrel brushes. Uh, just here we're using a, a squirrel flat brush. But for these highlights, again, squirrel. Softer, better for blending. It's certainly different doing these miniatures uh, as distinct from what we were doing the week before and the, with the, the large drawings and the large paintings of hands and faces and feet and things like that. Doing it in this minute detail. 
again looking up close at these highlights again using a fine squirrel brush a lot of control because again as is always with uh, Philip and Olga's instruction use a dry brush Now restoring some of the saturation or the chroma to the skin tones by doing a, a glaze of diluted uh, uh, flesh tone. The titanium white as is usual uh, tends to take out the saturation as well as uh, giving a lighter tone. Sort of a subtle mm, uh, relationship between tone and saturation. Let's see here how that colour is returning while retaining the, uh, the variation in tone between highlight and shadow. Now here's a delicate operation. Using the, the same uh, red-brown of the hair but very uh, diluted and with a squirrel brush putting in the general shape of the beard and moustache. Okay, some more instruction on painting the uh, loincloth. The film is putting in a, a lot of white here, really to cover his grey cardboard. But over the top of this will go the, the base colour and we'll still be able to see the the shadows, the, sh the shading that's been put in dark underneath. And a few coats later purple and red mixture. It says work on the, the large areas first. Let them dictate how it's going to work. And now with that in place he's uh, putting in beginning on the, the highlights. Later in the week, and I didn't catch this on video, but 
uh, having done all this uh, quite delicate, beautiful uh, highlighting on the loin cloth and getting the torso beautifully in place, he decided that the loin cloth was set too low, and then so he very drastically uh, <laughs> raised the loin cloth by painting right over the top and starting again in certain sections. It's one of the I don't know, helpful things that uh, you know, this expert doesn't get it right first time. So it helps us to know that, gosh, we, we can get it wrong, but also how to fix it up. So much of what we do is problem solving and fixing up mistakes. One of the tricky bits is recognizing them. And what Philip uh, does so helpfully is to glance and very quickly assess what's wrong. Now what I'm doing here is putting in the, in the halo in, in a pink and suddenly realized that the cross beam of the, uh, the cross was too low and it needed uh, correcting. And uh, there is <laughs> some signs of the correction. <laughs> uh, then for the, the cross in the halo, uh, I'm using lapis lazuli. This goes on quite pale at first and needed a lot of coats to build up to a, a good, strong and beautiful uh, lapis blue. For a structure that seems so straightforward and you can sort of do with a pair of compasses and with a, a, uh, a ruler, this halo was really quite tricky. This icon is quite a, a different style. The stance of the Christ is quite upright. Here is a beautifully uh, pale torso with wonderful highlights. And by contrast, a very dark skinned Christ and a halo that radiates light through to darker. And Philip is putting in the strands of hair in the beard and moustache. So, I tried to do the same, but first got my eye in by doing something a bit easier, like eyebrows.
the eyelashes actually cut them in the model the eyelashes are visible and I did manage to get the tiny tiny little eyelashes and now for the strands of hair in the beard done quite lightly not very visible but equidistant apart It's an excellent painting space. Here's Alison under instruction from Philip. And some close-ups. Look at those eyelashes. <laughs> and the eventual folds and the rather gory details. And there we are with all our different icons. So the ten of us painted our icons on the same size panel. All our icons of the crucifix looked different and mine looks like that. And I'm quite pleased with it. Thank you Philip for two wonderful weeks and to my colleagues who painted with me for wonderful fellowship and friendship uh, during that time.